All right, Molo Bonani. hello, how's it? Shalom, good evening. Welcome to another episode of Liberty and Friends here on the Big Daddy Liberty Show. My name is Usihle Ngobese, a.k.a. Big Daddy Liberty. Hey, ta-da. It's a Sunday evening at 8 p.m. You know what it is, Liberty and Friends, your week-ending news analysis show. Good evening and welcome to it. Uh, as always on Liberty and Friends, we'll bring on the panel of friends, and it's a, a revolving door, of, or a revolving uh, door, I'm right, uh, of friends, so to speak. Every week giving you compelling analysis you will not get anywhere else. Welcome to it. This is Liberty and Friends once again. Um, I do have a slight snag with one of my guests. Uh, I did see his commentary. I will try and get him on. Uh, this evening. Before I get to the guests, a quick reminder to you that uh, you are very much a part of Liberty and Friends, so make sure you get your comments in, please. And the best way you can do that is commenting whether you're watching this simulcast on Twitter, Facebook, or on YouTube. Welcome to it. Good evening. And as always, if you want to support the show, all of that information is in the descriptor of the video. And um, a reminder, before I get to any of my guests, your only price of admission here on the Liberty and Friends show is to hit that like button. Do it now. And um, as I always say, it, it literally feeds four kids in Africa, to which I am one of those kids. So you better hit that like button and uh, get my engagement over 50%, which means if there's 100 people watching, I should have 50 likes or dislikes. Hey, uh, it's a free country. You get to choose whether you like or dislike the show. Welcome to it. Um, tonight's guests are a mixed masala of guests. You like the little Durban reference there? <laughs> a mixed masala of guests. And uh, first up in the little roster I can see at the bottom of my screen is Upra Jacques Brutreich from Afri Forum. Jacques, good evening. Good evening, Sister. Great to be here again. Thank you very much for the invitation. <laughs> good evening, Jacques. Good to hear from you. And of course, Upra Chris Hatting from the Institute of Race Relations, there he is on screen. Chris, good evening. Good evening, Sikhle, evening, Jacques, and to the rest of the panelists. Thanks very much for having, uh, having me on. Looking forward to the conversation. E tada, e tada, that's Upra Chris Hatting, of course, from the Institute of Race Relations. He's their deputy head of campaigns in that part of the world. Shout out to the fellows at IRR. Upra Dumo Danga, there he is, host of the Man Patreon Show. Dumo, good evening. Hi, Sisha. Thanks for having me on, and thanks for coming on to our last show, which was aired on Monday. Much appreciated. Hey, man. That was a rocking show. Absolutely rocking show. I definitely enjoyed that. Speaking about a rocking character, someone who's looking to rock the gun world and the self-defense world, but of course, he's much more than that. He is the host of Paratus.info. I'm talking, of course, about Tupra Gideon Hubert. Gideon, good evening. Good evening, Sishle, and I always get nervous when you do that intro because I, I'm terrified I don't live up to expectations. But good evening, and uh, good to see you, Jacques, Chris, and Dumo. Uh, it's quite a powerhouse all in, in one panel tonight. How's it, guys? Absolutely. And to complete the powerhouse uh, 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 mix, so to speak, is Uu Richard Wilkinson, but he's having some issues with connecting online here. So I'm going to give him a chance in the background. He might join us in a couple of minutes as we troubleshoot getting him on. Uh, and with that being said, I must quickly just mention that Upra Jacques has to dash off in about, uh, let's say, 30, maybe 35 minutes. Uh, <laughs> I'm pushing an extra five minutes out of him there. Um, but uh, yeah, so just a uh, fair warning to those who were maybe hoping uh, that we were going to be a full, full house for the entire duration of the show. And again, guys, I mentioned duration of the show because Liberty and Friends is my one long format show. The show is between 90 minutes to two hours. And we unpack 
the news week that was. And let's get straight into that. Uh, because again, the dominating feature of the week, fellas, must have been the state of the nation address. There was quite a few nested features that I wanted us to unpack about this particular sona as I quickly go to my notes and I buy myself time by waffling away here. There we go. <laughs> um, I think top of mind for me was the reaction, the feedback from, broadly speaking, the, the broad coalition of, um, you know, sort of the commentariat and, of course, political parties. Now, even as I frame that question, I see Richard Wilkinson has joined us. Um, so let me just try and get him on screen very quickly. And um, Richard, good evening. Welcome to Liberty and Friends. Thanks so much, C. Clear, and hi to everyone. Sorry, I, I um, emailed myself the link, and part of my email signature joined itself onto the link. So when I clicked on the link, it took me to a floor. Oh. <laughs> Del, we know that feeling. Hey, man, yeah. technology can sometimes uh, hit us with a broadside, but uh, your sound levels yeah. are absolutely perfect. Welcome to it. Cool. This is Liberty and Friends. A reminder that the show is about a 90 minute show. It's well, one long format show here on the BDL show. And we were actually beginning to look at our first issue for the night, which really has many nested features, as I said at the beginning of the intro, which is the State of the Nation Address. The first area that I want us to look at, of course, is uh, the immediate reaction from political parties and, of course, the commentariat in the corporate media, a resounding, almost positive tone, aside, of course, from a few parties here and there, i.e. the EFF, a, a positive tone with many saying things like, oh, this was a fantastic speech because the president acknowledges the, the private sector. Chris, I must begin with you because, you know, I've always said when, on the show in particular, how I view politics is through the lens of most of how I analyze Shakespeare in particular. All of Shakespeare's work, you can whittle down broadly to the theme of appearances versus reality. And this speech was exactly that. The president gave the appearance of, oh, you know, we're going to go down the route of more market reform. The private sector is going to get involved. But really, the very nature of the ANC is very statist and corporatist. No, I mean, I think you've summed it up beautifully, beautifully there. Maybe you've buried the leader, but on my, well, you didn't actually, you did a, a good journalistic thing and didn't bury the lead. Um, I mean, the president started off by talking up the private sector and how, in his words, and I'm paraphrasing, but how the government doesn't create jobs, but the private sector does. Now, I think that was mostly said to set a, a nice tone from the start. When you look at what he actually said, I mean, some of the highlights or lowlights, depending, of course, in your ideological point of view. He said government is fundamentally still committed to national health insurance, committed to localization master plans. Uh, they're still committed to expropriation without compensation, as Minister Lamola has pointed out. So, yes, private sector is the only one that can create jobs, but none of the policies that the current administration is pushing will actually create the environment that will enable jobs to be created. Along with that, affirmative action policies, BE. We have the Employment Equity Amendment Bill, which the IRR is doing a lot of work on, which will allow the Minister of Labor to set um, sector targets in terms of employment. I mean, talk about destroying incentives incentives for investment, business formation and job creation. So, yeah, I think markets responded generally positively because a lot of people don't realize there's still this sort of idea of two factions and ANC and one is good led by the president and the other one is the radical economic transformation faction and oh look he's winning the day and his speech signaled that this government's getting he's getting private sector involvement now and skills and that sort of thing but as, as you rightly pointed out the ANC is still committed to centralization to statism there will be hints here and there there will be um, vestiges and little notes of reform just to tide investors over for the time being but we're not going to see the kind of radical reform, especially, I think, in the, in the energy sector in terms of oh. labor policy to get anything productive going in the 46% unemployment rate. You're not going to get proper investment without getting rid of very inflexible um, labor market regulations and that kind of thing. So, yeah, the president, I guess, gets another win for his fancy geflielde woorden, as he always does. He made some people very happy. But end of the day... I don't think the action is going to be there. Oh. You know, Jacques, I must come to you. And before I do, just quick housekeeping uh, notes to everybody. Guys, can you just mute your mics, please, if you're not talking? Uh, because some viewers are complaining of feedback. Um, but Jacques, you know, even as I come to you, um, for me, there's something interesting to be said here. 
just in keeping with that theme of appearances versus reality, the DA, for example, came out um, and said, oh, this is a wonderful speech. It came, uh, it almost came out of the DA's playbook is the words that they used. And once again, we have this weird uh, fanboying uh, of, of, of President Cyril Ramaphosa uh, playing into this notion of there being a good ANC. Your immediate read, of course, of the speech and your prospects or your hopes for so-called reform. Well, I think we should start off by um, firstly just, just admitting that President Sir Ron Forza would have been an excellent public relations manager. He knows exactly what to say when he needs to say it. Um, but I think the fact that he came out so pro and positive towards the private sector, uh, creating jobs, for instance, just shows how desperate the African National Congress is getting, because we all know very clearly that that's not the game plan. It's not the ideology. They've had close to 30 years to prove themselves. And I think it just shows that they're getting very, very desperate. There are uh, uh, cats on a hot tin roof at the moment and um, trying to, to attract the investment in as many way, different ways as they can. The problem that we're facing is that even though the president is now making these noises that sound pro-free market, which is what, what, what we would have liked to hear, we know what the ANC are, what they are. We've seen their true colors. They've proven themselves time and time again. And um, these beautiful speeches are not going to convince investors as long as there's uncertainty in the energy market, uncertainty regarding corruption, uncertainty regarding property rights, all of this uncertainty that the ANC has been uh, uh, creating for years now and strengthened under before this rule, as long as it's there, he's not going to get the investment that he wants to. Um, I can't speak on the of the DA's reaction. It, it was an interesting reaction to me. I would have thought they would have been a bit more critical. Um, but yeah, just to take on face value, what they said was true. The things, some of the things that he said was, was valuable and was true. Uh, for a moment there, I actually thought that he was listening, listening to Africa on a phone call when he was um, you know, delivering his speech. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Some of the things that he, that he said was absolutely spot on, but we know that um, that uh, Aleppo doesn't take the spot. Mm. And this one made interesting... The, the, the whole tone of the evening to more. And guys, we will get to some of the meats and potatoes of the speech itself, but I want to get that broad overview because I think it's quite important to do so because if you are someone who only consumes the corporate media in terms of news, you would have walked away listening to the commentary thinking, oh, okay, great. So things must be changing. The ANC must be finally learning its lesson and, and looking to the private sector to create these jobs. But it, it's funny for me when I hear people say this because Jacques, mentioned it right now and leopard doesn't change the spots guys it's been 20 20 what 28 years of democracy and we've seen exactly how the state looks at the private sector it doesn't see uh you know the business community as being your mom and pop shops you know the small business uh sector it sees the private sector as primarily being corporates the big guys the guys who effectively play ball uh with the political elites in fact they have a a nice little private club called nedlack where they do exactly this. They make decisions for themselves, um, often at the expense of smaller business. Jamal, let me come to you, and then I'll throw it to the rest of you guys in a moment. You know, the corporate sector, of course, loving the speech because he spoke their language to me. It's more rent seekers, or rather more benefit for rent seekers than the usual winners in our economy. Right. Um, yeah, I think the, the guys in the corporate sector were happy to hear it, but I think they also... Uh, probably uh, took it with a bit of skepticism given the history of the ANC. I mean, as for me, um, I didn't watch the whole speech because I remember the one time when Ramaphosa said that they were going to build a million houses in Alex and that promise has not been fulfilled. So I think that was good enough reason for me not to even watch the speech. So whatever he says here, even if he said that, look, Dumo, we are going to privatize this and that, I know they, they're not going to do it because, again, this is just... Oh, for sure. But uh, talking about Nedlack, yes. I mean, Nedlack, um, yeah, th this is a, th th that's a, actually an issue because a lot of the decisions that are made there are designed to, um, are designed for what corporatism, basically. Because if the government wants to introduce a policy, the question is, well, how can we as big corporates benefit from these government policies? It's not necessarily of how we can serve the customers or which gaps are in the market that we can find. It's more of, well, this government is a cash cow. Let's see what we can get out of it. And unfortunately, um, you know, this corporatism um, is not a good thing in the long run because, of course, um, you know, people are just going to be chasing the big government cash cow while actually um, 
uh, making the making customers suffer or making the market lose out. But again, that opens up a gap for other players as well. So corporates will be happy, but again, they may not be looking at the speech. They could. I think what's really going to matter is really what happens in that in those Ned lack meetings because that's when the that's when the intentions are really going to come out. Absolutely, and again, I, I want to give it a slight. Uh, uh, twist here as I thought to Gideon and Richard before we go into as I said that meat and potatoes part of the speech but chaps for me it was very funny and very interesting at the same time that you have a president who is effectively on the ropes here he got heckles effectively from both the statist socialist want to be communist bloc of the ANC the broadly referred to as the RET faction by the corporate media. That's the radical economic transformation uh, uh, types. And then he also got booze. He also got booze from the kleptocrats, the, the, the people who are just simply there, you know, to just steal uh, and see, for instance, uh, access and control over state-owned enterprises as being key to that because the SOEs are the ones who dole out the tenders and, of course, the lucrative contracts, which they then dole out to political elites. Those two camps clearly are pivoting and showing a, a disdain for U U Ramaphosa, only because, not because Ramaphosa is, is opening the market necessarily, but seemingly alienating the establishment and est establishing a, a, an almost parallel state, um, one that operates outside of the formal structures or the formal institutions of the state where cadres have been deployed. Let me be precise and specific. He's just employed uh, a few committees, he announced a few committees that is establishing. One of them was the red tape uh, team, the one that's meant to, you know, cut red tape uh, and the like. This is not situated in the Department of Small Business, for example. It's a standalone entity that is reporting directly to the president. Of course, and there's a few other entities that are doing exactly this. Khidion, is this a man who clearly, or seemingly rather, uh, let me not lead you in the questioning. <laughs> Uh, objection, leading the witness. Um, is this a man who is seemingly feeling uh, like he can't entrust his own cadres to do things uh, such as deliver? Well, he definitely can't trust his own cadres to deliver, which is why, uh, which is hilarious since he uh, deployed them and he was in charge of deploying them for a good many, many years. Uh, and it does tie in, of course, with his, his wonderful sort of speech that he gave at Sona. This is the same man that in 2015 told us that in 18 months uh, our troubles with ESCOM would be a thing of the past. And he has subsequently promised us supersonic bullet trains and smart cities and all sorts of things. So uh, he is not a man who you could ever judge by his words and certainly a man you should judge very critically and narrowly by his actions and keep a very close eye on those actions. And the creation of the parallel state uh, is interesting in the sense that the actual state as it is, is so wholly dysfunctional. I mean, you can't, you can't swing a, uh, a chain around uh, government without hitting about 10 dysfunctional government departments that are just not working at all. And that have been so crippled through decades of mismanagement, corruption, incompetence, and criminality that uh, they, they essentially no longer can fulfill even the most basic tasks and duties as demanded by their various mandates, constitutional or otherwise. This parallel state thing is potentially his ingenious solution to it. And so, no, it's cool. We'll just deploy more cadres directly under me. Uh, and then we'll start fixing problems, which is something he clearly doesn't understand, the problem-solving part. Because you do not create a committee to cut red tape. What you do with red tape is you just cut it. You don't require... Um, think tanks. In, th in fact, there's a very good think tank that's represented here. I mean, they could have just gone to have a chat to the Institute of Race Relations or the Free Market Foundation or AfriForum or all three of them pertaining to what do we need to do to make uh, the cost of business lower and make it easier for people to invest here and become more attractive and what can we do with regards to labor legislation to actually want people to uh, not, not encourage people to create jobs because I don't think you can ever do that, but to at least discourage them from from cutting them right and at least say cool you know at least don't be afraid to create jobs because the the, the, the environment is so business unfriendly so there's a lot to be said about the parallel state some of it 
depending upon how uh, much you've had to drink, it might sound pretty good. And the rest of it, yeah, I'm skeptical, essentially, very skeptical. Well, you and I both. And, um, you know, even as I say that, Richard, I'm going to come to you uh, because, you know, I want to keep to this theme of the creation of this parallel state, one that seems to alienate certain cadres. Um, you know, in favor of maybe other cadres that he sees uh, as as being uh, appropriate, rather, to to install. Um, and he, he plays this up as, oh, for instance, uh, how this chap who, who's heading up the red. Uh, sorry, I'm hearing myself in my ear, and it makes it a little difficult to focus. How he's you know sort of playing up the importance of this chap who's going to lead a red tape team is oh well you know this used to be a CEO of a a, a JSC listed firm called Sassel and most of us rolled our eyes when he said this because we're like oh, Sassel really that's your example of a good organization that needs someone uh, who then lead this notion of of cutting red tape there's something almost laughable about how we're we're we're, we're doubling down on failure by calling it novel and ingenious. Yeah, 100% percent you clear. And um, you know, I, I, I think I agree with what, what everyone said so far. Um, in a way, this was almost like a sort of speech that Helen Ziller gave in 2009 when she was first elected as Premier of the Western Cape. <laughs> you know, she started talking about cutting red tape and she set up this thing in the Western Cape Premier's office called the Red Tape Cutting Unit. Um, I don't know how much success the Western Cape had because they've got some difficulties to do with federalism and provincial powers. But anyway, Ramaphosa gets up there and gives a speech. And I got myself sent to Twitter jail once this week. And I think people have reported me a second time to the Sims for Cyril account because I, I said that this was the first time that Ramaphosa has actually said that government doesn't create jobs, the private sector creates jobs. And I, I don't know, just before my time, but I think you'd have to go all the way back to Trevor Manuel to find someone in the ANC who even said something like that. I'm not sure if Trevor Manuel and Tabo and Becky really believed it wholeheartedly, but I mean, Zuma every year would get up and say, the government's going to create 500,000 jobs, and these guys would never get it. Anyway, Ramaphosa's now said, he seems to have ideologically, the penny seems to have dropped there, or whoever wrote the speech, but my critics on Twitter are 100% correct. The NEC, I don't think you can find a single person on that NEC that is reform-minded. Um, and you know, if he puts this guy in the union buildings and says cut red tape, he's very quickly going to find that every proposal he makes is going to just be vetoed by the rest of his party. I mean, are you going to cut black economic empowerment? No. Are you going to get rid of the mining truck? No. Are you going to get rid of expropriation without compensation? No. On and on it goes. The minimum wage, uh, employment equity, um, or the, the mountain of regulation that just weighs down weighs down businesses. Are they going to get rid of foreign exchange controls? These are all ideas that are really there. And and I agree with what... what um, I think it was Gideon said, or Gideon said earlier, where he said, you don't need a committee to cut red tape, you just need to cut the red tape. And you don't have to replace it with anything either. Just get rid of foreign exchange controls, get rid of, of you know, just reduce the minimum wage from being what it is to being far lower so we can create more jobs, etc. So, you know, I, I, it's, it's interesting because I, it's, it's almost like, um, I think in the 1980s, F.W. de Klerk or occasionally even P.W. Boerter would sometimes get up and give a speech that gave this astonishing insight that they had finally, the penny had dropped for the Nats. And then they would row back on it. And, and at the end of the day, it turns out the National Party was beyond reform. It just, it just got taken out. And I think the ANC might go the same way because ideologically, it is a very ideological organization. And I think people often underestimate that. People often say, oh, the government's useless or they're clueless. They're not. They know exactly what they're doing. Another big myth in South Africa is that people say that the ANC government's got an implementation problem. They don't have an implementation. They're brilliant at implementing their own policies. They've got a policy problem. You often hear people say, oh, South Africa's got such good policies, we just can't implement it. No, our policies are bad. And that is the battle of ideas that we need to be engaged in. We need to point out to everybody that it's not just, I mean, when the DA gets into power one day, I sincerely hope that they don't try and fix ESCOM. ESCOM can't be fixed, okay? ESCOM should never have been created back in 1933. The solution to this problem is to open up the grid to anyone who wants to produce power and then take ESCOM's assets, the stuff that anyone wants, sell it, okay? Try raise some funding from that, shut down the, the company, try give everyone a six-month sort of pay package or something and say goodbye to ESCOM. That's the solution. And too often from Ramaphosa, still, we hear about him trying to fix things or implement things better. And you hear the, the commentariat going along with that narrative. 
And in my opinion, we still need a, a lot of work to do to shift that narrative. Absolutely. And you, you've introduced something quite interesting here, uh, which I'm going to stick with you, Richard, then I'm going to go to Jacques because he has to leave in a moment. Um, you know, it's almost like that, 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 that dichotomy, therefore, in thought, where the ideal would be to federalize, break things up, allow for multiple players to come in, thus encouraging a, an inherent competition that drives prices down or seeks to drive prices down. The consumer benefits, of course, where if they're in a country with a stable currency, they're able to save, build up household savings from an income, of course, and over time, increase wealth. You know, that, that would arguably be the, the, the overarching formula that you would hope uh, we're going to create um, in, in that ideal. But we actually see the other side of the dichotomy, which is increasing centralization, increasingly, you know, governing by fiat, so to speak, uh, where there is smart people in inverted commas who have to be at the helm of things um, in order for them to work. Let me be precise in, in this where I'm going here, Rich, so you can chew on it. Um, we have a president here, and this is not being spoken of in the corporate media. We have a president here, guys, if, you, if you're noticing, and I often say, don't be dribbled, who's centralizing power within the presidency bit by bit by bit. Let's consider, for example, not so far long ago, pardon me, state security as a function was usurped and placed into the hands of the presidency. And now we're, we're finding out various components which exist in various departments are now being centralized within the presidency via these committees appointed by the president who are duplicating work in some cases. Um, that's the part that I'm not hearing in the corporate media in terms of analysis here. Your thoughts on this? Are we seeing, you know, what's his name? I forget his name on, on, on Twitter. He got into a bit of trouble from Max Dupree uh, when he made a similar comment where he, he suggested um, that, you know, this could be the very road to a, a, an almost totalitarian type arrangement where if not Cyril, the next guy who realizes, oh heck, this office has a lot of power, might then say exactly that, I'm, I'm in charge, I'm the king. Yeah, 100%, and you can see parallels with Downing Street. Uh, Tony Blair got a bit frustrated because Downing Street's a very small street in Westminster physically, and it's dwarfed by these other big departments on Whitehall. And you can only fit like 50 people in Downing Street. And so, you know, Tony Blair would give an instruction to the education department and then he'd give another one. And they're still implementing the previous initiative that he had six weeks ago. And so by the end of his premiership, he just wanted to create a massive department of the prime minister in Downing Street. Um, the Americans did that in the Eisenhower executive building. Um, and the British look at the Americans with envy and they think, oh, well, you know, we should copy what they did. Um, there was a journalist in South Africa called Brian Pottinger who wrote a great book about Mbeki called The Mbeki Legacy. And in my opinion, it was the best book written about post-apartheid South Africa. And Brian Pottinger, um, he wrote a book previously called The Imperial Presidency. It, it was about P.W. Boerter because as P.W. Boerter, as the system of apartheid collapsed under its own contradictions and as the country became more and more ungovernable, P.W. Boerter just concentrated all the power in the presidency. Uh, he made himself executive president of the country. He used to be the prime minister, and there was this chairman president. He got rid of the chairman president, made himself the dictator of South Africa, and tried to um, come up with a total strategy to fight back against what he called a total onslaught. And he was unsuccessful. Eventually, his entire project collapsed, and they wrapped the thing up. And I think Ramaphosa is going the same way. Now, you can't govern South Africa like that. If you want to run this country, in my opinion, you got to do two things, federalism and privatization. So what the Western Cape should be doing, I think they are doing, I, I wish they had done it 10 years ago, is they need to press really hard to have everything handed over to them. But even that isn't going to solve the problem. What then needs to happen is that Wales Street in Cape Town, which is where the provincial government is, they need to then privatize this stuff, right? They, they, need, to, they need to take energy in the Western Cape or education or healthcare or whatever it is, and make it a whole lot more consumer facing by opening it up to the market and trying to reduce the involvement of the state. And I think that's eventually where we, I mean, I hope we end up with a coalition government in two years time, but um, I think Ramaphosa's presidency is gonna imitate PW Borders. I know that um, uh, Jacques has to leave, so let me hand over to you, Sifu. Absolutely, and, and maybe let me get, cut straight to him because I think he might also have, be having connection issues now. I think his phone is saying, hey, man, we need to leave. Um, Jacques, dude, again, maybe just as, as your final thought on this, for me, there is a conversation to be had about the centralizing of power, uh, number one. Number two, the creation of this parallel state 
uh, which can have nefarious agenda, by the way, you know, just because people happen to trust uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, and again, I'm not saying I trust him, I'm just making the point, the guy still has a 53% approval rating in this country. People have a weird affinity to this guy. Um, but there is something to be said here, and it's not being spoken about, about the dangers of an ANC in its dying years, centralizing power and creating something that actually might be difficult to get rid of. And we've lost Jacques. Okay, we have lost Jacques. Uh, Chris, let me throw that to you and then Gideon. Thanks. All I'd add on this is just recommend people go and read Professor Kurs Malan's work on the parallel rule of law state and how laws and regulations are put in place to ensure that those with the necessary political connections can continue uh, using the resources of the state to shape society in the in the way that they believe and for many in the media and the commentariat sort of in the suburbs especially um those who have clapped on lockdowns very much the last two years especially as a notable highlight who believe that the state will eventually function we just need to get the right people in place and as professor Malan, um, i think rightly points out that's not what's being created. What's being created is through cater deployment and affirmative action and everything like that. And it's ilk is just a separate apparatus which doesn't function. It's not accountable to parliament. It's not any of the trappings of democracy and parliamentary democracy and the rule of law and that sort of thing. So people shouldn't be surprised when, for example, reform doesn't come, come from the NC because that's not its ultimate goal. Its ultimate goal is the National Democratic Revolution. Absolutely. Jacques, I know I need to let go of you, um, but very, maybe as your final word, um, what are you guys up to over that Afri Forum? I know you guys are back in court tomorrow, the very important case. In fact, I did a vlog on it last week around the hate speech case. Is that continuing next week? Yeah, definitely. That's still continuing. That's the hate speech case against uh, Julius Salem on the EFA for King Field of Work and Farmer. And uh, last week was quite a riveting week in court. Uh, the EFS tried a few dirty moves, but uh, we managed to come out strong. And uh, we'll be continuing oh. to fight tomorrow. Tomorrow we're actually calling um, uh, victims of farm attacks as with us. Uh, oh. So how the song actually impacts has a real, real life impact. It's not just some ideological solo song. It has, has real impact on, on real people's lives. Absolutely. And that'll be compelling um, testimony. I'll keep an eye. On that, as I said, I did a vlog about this issue, albeit through a, a different angle, from a video from you, Jacques, uh, uh, those deranged lefty shouting in, in the court about how singing about killing white people is part of their heritage, they say. Um, but with that being said, Jacques, how do we reach you on social media before we let you go? Thank you very much, Cecil. People can follow me on Twitter, just at Jacques Bredreich. And um, yeah, I'm on Facebook as well, all of that, but I think Twitter is the most relevant. Uh, news angry website for these types of discussions. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you very much for the great panel. It's always insightful, guys. Apologies for having to leave early. Awesome. Thank you. That is, of course, Ooh, Jacques Bridrick from Afri Forum. First, but now, the man who had a in the Johannesburg Hof. And that's the uh, hate speech case, of course, that they're dealing with in that part of the world. Let's, guys, let's hop straight into it before I do that. It is the uh, half past um, eight or so, uh, 30 minutes into the show. Welcome to it. This is Liberty and Friends. My name is Osikle Ngobese, AKA Big Daddy Liberty. I'm in conversation with ooh, Richard Wilkinson. There he is at the bottom of the screen there. He is, of course, a writer and an attorney out uh, there in the Fair Cape. Shout out to Richard, of course. And Uchidio Nuber, there he is, the host of Paratus.info. Make sure you check them out and their work. Absolutely fantastic stuff when it comes to our gun rights and self-defense and all things liberty related in that regard. Oh, Chris Hatting, as he has a bit of water there for his parched throat. Hey, man, it's going to be a, a bit of a long show, so get a bit more water there, homie. Chris Hatting, of course, the deputy campaign's uh, head at the uh, Institute of Race Relations. Shout out to Richard. Uh, uh, pardon me, to Chris. I see you. And Udumo Denga, the host of the Man Patriot Show. Make sure you like and you subscribe to their channel on YouTube. Excellent conversations in that part of the world. Fellas, I must move us on. Maybe still sticking to the, or are we? Hang on, let me just check my notes here quickly. Um, you know, maybe just still sticking to the solar for a brief moment. Um, 
The other component to the speech, which I think is the important one, it really had sort of three areas. The economy, broadly speaking, the administration, um, and safety and security, a massive admission. And I say massive, I'm being slightly sarcastic and cheeky here because we've been having this conversation, it's, you know, just because the president is admitting it now is neither here nor there, but an admission nonetheless that his government is culpable for what happened in this country in July last year when parts of Gauteng and, of course, KwaZulu Natal dis descended into chaos. Uh, Gideon, a man who says, yeah, look, we're responsible for this. Uh, that's why I commissioned this report, but then doesn't resign, doesn't seemingly chop any heads in that moment. Uh, does that inspire any confidence? And nested in that question, what can and what should he do? So, no, not only did, uh, you know, apart from the written admission, there's been no action that has flowed from it. And something else within that report that, that, that really sort of got under my skin quite badly is amongst the conclusions at the very end, they took issue with the communities that protected themselves. And they very clearly state that, that there, are, there are very good reasons why the state reserves the monopoly on the use of, of armed force. And I thought, in our democracy, right? I'm saying, hmm, you cannot call this a democracy whilst at the same time telling me the state reserves the sole monopoly on the use of armed force because that would actually be a dictatorship. Uh, well, certainly not a democratic state. So not only have they done nothing, socially, even by the contents of that report, it doesn't seem that they've actually learned anything of value um, out of compiling it. And what we're sitting with is an incredibly dysfunctional state security apparatus, primarily the South African police service and everything bolted onto it from crime intelligence to actual public order policing and, and, and everything in between. It is a leaderless, rudderless entity that is criminally mismanaged. It is corrupt and incompetent. Uh, it is top heavy with a bunch of over bloated uh, SAPS managers from ranks of brigadier and general and, and good knows what else. And the overwhelming majority of the people in charge of that organization need to go. There needs to be an overall purge of SAPS management in a sense of just throw them all out into the street on their ear. And then with a fine tooth comb, you kind of have to go through CVs and check references to see if you want uh, any of them back in. A major problem with the SAPs is they've hemorrhaged talent from the lower ranks. So we're talking about special task force members, station police officers, uh, detectives, this sort of thing. That The type of guys that should be coming through the rank that got stuck at constable, sergeant and warrant officer for decades, never got adequately promoted that understand policing, that understand the principles of policing, community policing, visible policing, all these sorts of things. The, the really good, dedicated, professional policemen and uh, policewomen, they should have been deployed into leadership positions, but because they were not uh, politically the correct uh, people for the job, you know, and they, they weren't royal game, they were passed over and passed on, and eventually they left the service. So we sit with two problems. One, it's a very mismanaged police service that was facing six years of in-cap, well, it's already had three years of, of significant budget cuts. It's another three years uh, coming in which when you take inflation to account by 2025, the SAPS would have lost about its budget, we've lost about 51% of its purchasing power from 2019. Um, this organization isn't well managed and it's lost its talent. So I don't even know if it's fixable, to be honest. Uh, in an ideal universe, you'd federalize policing completely and you would have it done on a municipal level, a provincial level, a county level, a whatever but certainly not a centrally managed South African police service because July is the proof in the pudding of exactly what you get is no meaningful response, no meaningful intelligence uh, that was acted upon, uh, a complete criminal mess, to be honest. And Sela needs to go, Setole needs to go, and a whole bunch of other people. I have a long hit list of people in that organization, in that ministry that needs to go. If you, if, if you want it, let me know. I'll send it to you. <laughs> and you know what frightens me, chaps? You know, if you take a moment and you walk the streets of your, your nearest township, in my case, I'm here in Mlazi, just outside of Durban, one of the largest townships in the country. 
not more than 45 minutes before this broadcast, heavy gunfire, heavy gunfire towards G section. Um, you know, and just as I was sort of saying, huh, you know, that, that that's it's a light evening, you know, just, just 15 shots tonight on J section, which is just across the valley from me. Uh, I can hear spinning tires and, and, and also heavy gunfire, uh, automatic in some cases. I then think to myself, there is some dude out there who has an automatic rifle. I can hear him fire it off, self-loading uh, rifle. And it begs the question, where did he get that fire, uh, firearm? If not from across the border, he definitely got it from police stations. Gideon, I want to stick with you here for a moment. Sorry, guys. I just want to give uh, Gideon the first real bite of this apple because we've had this conversation in relation to what happened at Norwood. Uh, and we we argued when we had the conversation that Norwood is, is not an isolated example. There are fat cats within the police force who not only draw a salary as, as you know, warrant officer or whatever, senior brigadier rather, uh, but also get a, a second salary, an undeclared salary, from their dealings with criminals as they hand over guns from them. I would have hoped the president would have had a conversation about that, in addition to firing Ele, in addition to firing Ukekas Tole, and saying, you know what, a complete overhaul and reform of the South African police service, federalize it, et cetera, et cetera. But nothing on that. If anything, we, we just keep quiet about SAPS itself becoming a criminal organization. Well, and that's the problem. So not only, you know, everyone by now, I, I assume, knows of the fact that the National Commission in 2018 already said that it's impossible for the police to fulfill its constitutional mandate, which already brings its right to exist even uh, into question, as in why do we have this centralized national law enforcement organization that cannot fulfill its mandate, then should it even exist? Should it not just frankly be shut down and replaced by something that can actually do the job that's required? Um, and this is not necessarily a question of incompetence, but it is the same thing that's happened to Danil. It's the same thing that happened to South African Express. It's the same thing that happened to uh, a whole bunch of other state-owned entities uh, that escape me now. They are not actively shut down. They are neglected to death, very much like you'd neglect a child to death, as opposed to just outright murdering it. And th there's no, no difference here with the SAPs. It's this failed sick ship sick building syndrome that it that, that it has developed a, a culture of endemic corruption and incompetence and we have seen reports from south african national defense force depots uh, as far back as 2015 when i read my first one uh, about the major depot at jan kempdorp which i said the fences were in disrepair and it was this effectively unguarded and any member of the public could just simply walk in and help themselves to farms ammunition vehicles whatever they wanted and there would be you know no real uh, barrier to stop them from doing so and we've seen police stations being targeted and robbed specifically for arms and ammunition over the past two years uh, you know it happens every couple of months so we have a problem where law enforcement not only is actively supplying criminals through negligence and through criminality uh, with weapons but where we are seeing members of law enforcement and the armed forces actually actively participating in high standard criminal activity uh, I mean in the past two days I, I saw two separate reports of police officers and, and SANDF members caught with uh, other cash and transit heist robbers and other home robbers and, and farm attackers and this sort of thing. So there is a definite problem of the SAPS is infiltrated by criminals more than it than it is succeeding in infiltrating them. And that line I stole directly from an RR Broken Blue Line report. I think the the last one that came out a few years back. Mm. So it's a it, it's a crisis. It needs urgent action, and there's been nothing forthcoming. As you rightly mentioned, the president hasn't even acknowledged it verbally in Sona. And it, with, with something of this level of urgency, you'd expect it to at least be be mentioned, at least in passing, at the state of the nation address, because that is the state of the nation. You know, it, it gets very frightening, Dumont, when you as a citizen see an officer in blue walking into a known drug den 
in some cases, you went to the police station to report that uh, that drug den or that whatever the case may be, and those very same cops you reported to are waltzing in and out of that venue with brown envelopes. It becomes very dangerous then when that same community recognizing the failure of SAPs to enforce the law, that community decides to take the law into their own hands. And suddenly you're seeing scenes as, as happened here in Mlazi. Uh, in fact, I won't name this particular individual because he's quite a prominent gangster, uh, almost beaten to near death in the streets uh, where ordinary, ordinarily ordinary law abiding citizens become killers in their own right because of the frustration of, of the criminal justice system, not responding to, to criminals. Right. Um, you know, and that's the thing, you know, when, uh, when vigilantes come up, um, obviously they may have good intentions, but they may also harm innocents uh, along the way, uh, which is obviously something that we want to avoid. But what is interesting, I spoke to a security guard this week and he was telling me about um, the levels of corruption within the police. Like, um, there are apparently, you know, there's some police stations that are better than others. And sometimes police stations from Joburg, when they go to Pretoria, um, they may do a better job and so forth. And what I heard that even with the drug situation, what I even heard was that, um, you know, uh, police people tip, uh, tip other criminals off when they, when there's investigations and so forth. And that is a very, very, um, sad situation to be in because, um, you know, when, when these guys are tipping each other off and so forth, people lose confidence within the police. Some will, you know, arm themselves and just protect themselves should the situation arise. But there will be those who will think that, you know what, if the police are not going to uh, do their job, then I will do it for them. And we saw what happened with uh, the, the so-called John Wick from Mamelodi, where he actually, I, I don't know if this was real or what, but I mean, um, it, it definitely seemed plausible where they showed uh, gangsters' cars, you know, be, being uh, scorched and have bullet holes and everything like that. And um, that's what happens. You're going to get these uh, vigilantes coming up and they're going to do the, well, let me not say do the, 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 the job of the police because the police may not go as far as killing the gangsters. They just need to arrest them. But then uh, some vigilantes go that far. And when it reaches that stage, I mean, what does Beggy Taylor do? He holds another press conference. He goes to the scene of the crime, says whatever he needs to say, and then he goes home and that's it. So I just yeah. think, and, and you'll say he's concerned as well. So I, I, I think, you know, when, you know, when law enforcement is just not doing their job, it really breeds other things that are un, other unintended consequences. And some of them are, are, are tragic. Yeah, I was about to say, even as you mentioned Lupe Hitler's name, you know, I know some people saying, hey, don't say that Assad's name on the show, because he really, he's become the minister of condolences, because he always rocks up to express condolences where something happened. Uh, but very little in the way of actually an active policing, uh, visible policing that, that deals with crime head on and the erosion really of, of the protection of people's life, liberty and property rights. Um, guys, I'm going to wrap the section up in a moment, Chris, uh, Chris and then I'll, I'll come to you, uh, Richard, because Richard, there's something I want you to, to tackle as an attorney in particular. Maybe you've seen it um, in, in, in our courts, but I'll come to you in a moment. You know, Chris, there's a conversation here to be had around, you know, do I, do I, as the citizen, sorry, I'm trapped by my own sentence construction here. Let me rephrase this question. You know, Chris, someone might be sitting in their home right now thinking, yeah, but I pay the tax. And then I pay, you know, just in the beginning of this month, the debit order went off for ADT or blue security or fidelity, or whatever the case may be. Heck, I just went, I just come from, Builders Warehouse, where I've just self-installed some beams or some cameras. People are investing a lot of money into their own security. And now you have a situation where they can't even look towards the formal institutions that are meant to protect them uh, uh, for any sort of reprieve. Top solution from, or a top intervention, pardon me, from your side that you would have hoped the president would have raised in Asuna. Well, maybe the biggest thing would have been... Uh letting go of all his SOEs and spending all that money on uh, welfare and that sort of thing. I mean, looking at other ways of improving community upliftment, if he wanted to talk about social programs and that sort of thing, then you can talk about the, the negative and unintended, maybe in some cases intended effects of economic policies, which drive people into 
unemployment and desperation. Just in terms of the personal safety point, I mean, obviously it's easier to state proof yourself when you have more money and buy the beams and the other equipment that you might need. But And I will lean on someone like Hideon here and his networks and insights, but you can still very much count on people around you. And when at least you talk to each other and you form some kind of relationship with your neighbors and your community organizations, community groups and churches, at least there's some sort of no local knowledge of the challenges and the issues around you. So then you know what might be coming and that can also help you prepare in some way. So I'm not saying it's going to give you the best equipment, but it's better to be somewhat prepared than not. And I would very much advise people to lean on that sort of it's almost a way that the stronger your connections and your your intra connections are in your communities, the more resilient the community can be to shocks um, that that come around the corner and which probably will come. Uh, obviously, July 2021 was not the last of that sort of rioting and violence that I think we're going to see. So just for the time being, I think hunker down and do the best you can. I unfortunately can't call for a um, for tax evasion as such or not paying tax, but at least get bang for your buck and, and your relationships with you to people around you and when you stay proof yourself. So. Absolutely. Um, you know, Richard, I'm going to throw it to you, then I must, we must move on, guys. Uh, you know, I, I often fret and worry about the legal profession in this country. You know, what are you guys seeing when you head into courts of law? Are you seeing, for example, or maybe let me phrase it this way, because you're not a prosecutor, Richard, uh, but when you speak to friends of yours who might be prosecutors, when they receive those dockets, are they receiving competent, high-quality stuff which actually facilitates them being able to, to, to see a prosecution through? Yeah, look, um, I am an attorney, but I'm a, a tax attorney. I've never set foot in the uh, court. So, <laughs> um, so you deal with another kind of evil? <laughs> another yeah, kind I of evil. About this. Look, I, I mean, think there needs to be some cancellation not. happening. I don't know. After Richard's tweet this week, and also now that I found out he's a tax <laughs> attorney, I don't tax know. Attorney. Yeah, no, it dealt, dealt with SARS. I mean, often what happens with SARS is you... You get in a sense... a lot of garlic and uh, all the crews mix up. You get an assessment from them and then you object to it and then they sort of disallow your objection and there's like one line explanation. So you send them a 17 page objection and you get like one line back from them, you know, and, and it's it's quite frustrating. No, look, I, I think I think with the courts, um, from what I've heard, you know, I, I thought about going to the bar to become an advocate. I might still do that. So I might be in the high court one day. Um, I've got some friends at the Cape Bar um, and th their views are... A bit mixed, probably not as pessimistic as you might think. Um, but it's, at the end of the day, I think what, what, what I have heard someone say is that the, I think it was um, someone on Twitter. I don't want to quote the wrong person. Um, I'm pretty sure it was Richard Spur who said this. I speak under correction. Apologies if I've got it wrong. But the quality of the high courts have gone down. Okay? And so there's now this sort of avalanche of appeals upwards to the SCA and to the Constitutional Court. Um, and so the burden on the upper courts is on the superior courts is increasing as more and more people appeal stuff, um, which is not good for, for you know, the wheels of justice. And, um, and yeah, I think it's, it's the usual bureaucracy and administrative challenges of, of in South Africa. I think it's, you know, I think probably COVID in some ways is, has helped because it's moved a lot of stuff online and people have just had to move online. So you're not constrained by rules that were written in 1936 that say you have to file this document here or there. They've just made it work online which is probably a good thing. And I think increasing digitization and uh, the quality of technology, um, that's not due to the brilliance of the South African government. It's due to the brilliance of Apple and Google. But um, hopefully that can help and hopefully that can create more of a digital track record. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think I think, I think think Clair, uh, it's battling. Yeah. Fellas? As we head to that 9 p.m. mark, welcome to it. If you've just joined us, this is Liberty and Friends. We're heading to the final half an hour of the show. Uh, pardon me, of the show. Time does fly over here. If we are running a little behind on topics, I might indul ask my guests to indulge me just with an extra 15 minutes max. <laughs> it sometimes does happen, but welcome to it. This is Liberty and Friends. Hey, guys, my likes are nowhere near where they should be. Remember, my engagement should be over. 50%. If there is 220 of us watching, the like should be way um, over this, at least 100 plus, please. So hit that like button right now, especially if you're liking 
the conversation. We're beginning to cook with Chris. Greece, welcome to it. This is Liberty and Friends. Guys, I want to move us on to a, another topic, really, which uh, dominated this week for me because it, it, it spoke to something which is very close to home. This particular facility is not more than, let's call it 25 minutes away from me, and that's the Sapref refinery. This is a, a, a joint venture between BP and Shell, uh, who run this oil refinery together and produces, um, you know, uh, I think it's near on 30% of the country's fuel needs, and it's now literally being mothballed. It's been shut down. Uh, Sapref basically saying, that's it. We're not going to invest any more money into refining because the policy environment in this country is simply absolutely dodgy. Not their words, my words. Uh, but uh, effectively reflecting what other refiners have been doing also, whether it's Chevron, uh, I know Caltex also had a facility which they mothballed, and of course, Engine recently due to a fire in fairness but still hasn't come back online there's something to be said here uh chris about big manufacturers guys who do big things saying you know what the policy environment is absolutely trash uh we operate in an environment where small entrepreneurs perhaps perhaps don't have the kind of capital to enter and wouldn't enter anyway because they'll face the same hurdle that we face by way of policy environment um and the danger here chris is we're already importing 60% of our fuel needs in this country. If more refiners shut down, we might be heading into a bit of trouble here. Yeah, and just wait for um, for the emperor in the east to expand uh, the former Soviet Union, and uh, then you'll see fuel and grain prices go up in South Africa as well. Just uh, get ready for, for what might happen in the eastern part of Europe in the next uh, week or two. Um, look... South Africa's ports and railway are, of course, in a pretty decrepit state. So it already makes the movement of fuel, for example, very difficult. That's why you see increased trucks on the roads. That's why the truck, the, the roads are also uh, falling apart a bit because the necessary maintenance isn't done. But they also don't really have the capacity to handle that sort of freight. Um, I'd, I think this might be linked to the defeat uh, that Shell experienced in December last year around uh, their plans to conduct a seismic survey for oil and gas reserves below the seabed of South Africa's wild coast. So this might be them trying to play that sort of, uh, I don't know, whatever analogy you want to use, 4D chess, they're playing checkers while everyone else is playing chess kind of thing. Um, maybe they're trying to put pressure on government in this way by saying, sort this out now, otherwise we're simply going to keep our factory mothballed. I know they've said that they're going to look at getting a buyer potentially, but who's going to come in? Maybe some Chinese investors or Russian investors, for example, want to expand into um, Southern Africa even more. So just prepare, I think, for even higher fuel prices. I mean, government isn't going to slash the taxes and the levies that it collects as part of the fuel price, so it's not going to lower the fuel price in that way. And when you have more constrained supply and higher demand, prices are going to rise. Maybe, although maybe we should actually say, and we should hope for this at some point, maybe the, the competition commission will look at high prices in the fuel sector and maybe they will try and do some busting in terms of the monopoly that government has in setting the fuel price. I mean, dare I, as a classical liberal, ask for the competition commission to intervene on my behalf in fuel prices, maybe. <laughs> As much <laughs> as much as they, don't whatever, tell Martin um, van Staden I said that. Brother. Say, say again, Chris. Don't tell Martin van Staden I said. Yeah, that. I was about to say that's exactly what's going. Wherever Martin is right now, he is exploding. Um, but there is something to be said that that last point, Dumo. I want to throw it to you because one of the issues that the refiners are citing as a major concern is that the Department of Mineral and Eni Mineral Energy and Energy, sorry, I might be butchering that, but the Energy Department effectively, um, in passing new regulations is that South Africa is going to move to a new fuel standard that closely reflects what the Europeans are getting now. In other words, a level of refining that the Europeans currently enjoy in their petrol. It's a higher grade of petrol. And obviously in that, there's a higher input cost for a refinery. So they're saying, hey man, if you are not going to allow us to charge what we then need to charge to recover the costs for the extra refining, then we simply are we're, we're making the hard decision here to rather shut down than invest in something that will be a loss-making uh, venture. Dumo, the major issue here is the state is at the core a reason as to why we might face fuel constraints in this country. 
Right. Um, that's it, and it's exactly that. There's no one there who can actually think ahead and say, whoa, if we put in a regulation of this nature, uh, they might pull out. And then someone probably in the room said, nah, that's never going to happen. They'll just pay the money. And look what happened. Now they're threatening to leave. And I bet that guy uh, is looking like a fool right now. And that's the problem. I mean, where do they even get this this higher grade fuel from? Because the, the reality is that Look, I mean, it, I mean, I put petrol in my car. It, I mean, I let it 93, 95, like, you know, it, it works either way. You know what I mean? So I don't know why we need to get this higher grade fuel. What, what does it do? Is it more efficient or whatever? Do, do we save on petrol costs? I don't know. But I mean, it, it's unnecessary. And plus, even if this fuel was better and people are willing to pay more for it, then there would be a market for it and they'll right. provide for it. And maybe it could be a, a niche product or something like that that can only be afforded by a few people. But I mean, the, the state doesn't have to get involved here. They don't have to impress anybody. You know, at, at best, I mean, they could have at least uh, advised um, uh, Supref that, look, you should include this product in your mix and see how it works. You know what I'm saying? Because now when you try to implement the policy, you've just now, you've, you, you've just made things worse for everybody. You put them in a far worse position because refining is not cheap. It's not a cheap oh. business. It's a very expensive business. And, um, you know, it, it, it works on volumes as well. And, um, you know, and uh, also now, if you look at the, the fuel price, I mean, when I, when I filled up my card today, I mean, I put some, I put 500 Rand and I'm like, are you sure it's not 50 Rand? Because really they did absolutely nothing. Yeah. But, but but that's the reality, you know, people are going to complain. I mean, if, if these guys pull out, um, it's going to be a problematic because, you know, this could turn out to be violent because um, consumers are going to get pissed off. They're going to feel like they're getting screwed over. They're like, you guys keep increasing the price and then someone's going to jump in and someone like Julius Malema and so forth are probably licking their lips and probably take advantage yeah. of it. So the, these, the government must just go back to subref and sort something out i mean i'm pretty sure they can negotiate something and and, and that's perhaps you know even as you said that Dumo, <clears throat> i know someone who's losing their minds perhaps as if they're watching this and i say one figure ivo fechta because he writes quite extensively about this issue that we are in conflict as a country at times by the environmental lobby now don't get me wrong because i know i'm going to kick a hornet's nest here of uh, hippies and tree huggers are saying oh but you know as they play their guitars and you know in a drum <laughs> drum circle, um, you know. And don't get me wrong, guys. You know, I'm not being flippant because I'm saying I don't care about the environment. But I I'm being flippant only insofar as I recognise that there is nothing more dirtier than no energy. Um, and I know people don't understand that when I say that oh, nothing's dirtier than no energy. Well, take a trip down places where you don't have people who use efficient forms of energy. Things get very very dirty, so to speak, and, and actually worse off for the environment. I don't know waffle on this point. Gideon, let me come to you, Richard, in a moment. Um, we're, we're facing a situation where, yes, there are lofty goals that we want when it comes to protecting the environment and the like, but there are realities which are much more pressing right now. And what one would have expected our priority should be to get energy into the market, get people working, lift people, let the tide rise, lift people, to become a sort of uh, middle class uh, and then like then begin to worry about things like the environment what we can do from there so 100 percent essentially but uh, and i'm glad you came to me because i'm actually on this issue on the environmentalist side and i will explain to you exactly why oh here we go um <laughs> because I, i'm a big free market economist so i believe in the free markets mm -hmm. so i believe uh you know in energy e exploration and exactly everything you said is 100 percent correct our problem with the fact that we live in south africa is that the benefits of this energy exploration is all in all likelihood going to be perverted to some degree or another by the amount of patronage political interference corruption Absolutely. regulatory capture all these awful things in uh, th that we can actually take for granted as part of our, our, our sort of economic sphere. So in a rational country, uh, exploring for energy resources is really just a straightforward, rational decision. And there's nothing strange or, or, or bizarre about it. In South Africa, it involves so much corruption that... I think the only people who are going to benefit from this 
would be the multinational corporation itself, its executives, as well as the, the government um, <clears throat> and its connected cronies. And in all likelihood, whatever damage is done in this process will be left uh, unresolved. And the people who actually live in that community and uh, on the wild coast would all likely just be, as as the mines with their silicosis issues, just left the people to fend for themselves and, and, and wipe their ass. Because we do not actually have a system in this country that protects property rights and we do not have a system that actually protects the rights of the individuals that 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 uh, are the owners or custodians of of a resource or an element and that is my main concern is the fact that um you know we can't it would be the same with fracking in the career what concerns me elsewhere elsewhere is if you look at the refining of petrol okay a, pe a petroleum fuel uh, is a consumer good that is very priced and elastic in its demand in the sense that you can push the price of it up fairly astronomically and it probably won't make a massive difference to the amount of fuel people choose to consume because petrol needs to be consumed for the economy to run. It's probably the, the single most important input in the economic activity in SA. The firms that supply it are oligopolistic, meaning there's very few of them and they're all competing for millions of potential customers. When oligopolistic firms with a, a demand price and elastic product start heading for the hills because the policy environment is that fucking toxic, that's a big ass red flag. That is a massive indicator of things not being okay. And I think Chris nailed it. He, he said, you know, be, gird your loins, prepare for... Uh, fuel shortages prepare for uh, and everything that that is potentially forward and backward linked to an event and a disruption like that because um that might be exactly what's on the cards for us and you know may, maybe richard you'll wrap up the segment for us because i don't know where you stand on this but we've raised something here which is critically important if we are going to actually protect the environment and one of the best ways you do that is to strengthen property rights you know the idea that someone who perhaps uh, has a mining company next to them doing something and if they trash the environment that person needs to be able to go into a court of law and say look the activities of a you know the activities activities pardon me of a mining company who are trying to honor a contract between them and a customer has affected me the third party and so far as I'm, you know, dealing with acid mine drainage or an oil spill and I'm not able to fish anymore, I need to be able to claim damages against those guys who are in that contract so that it also incentivizes others who embark on that behavior not to repeat that behavior. But we don't have that uh, to a large extent in this country. And I think that's what a lot of communities uh, were a bit cagey about, you know, the, the secrecy sometimes between these big multinational corporations with the ANC government and feeling as though decisions are made about them without them. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, it's one of those counterintuitive things you figure out as you grow up, although some people never do grow up, but um, often the left is the loudest when it comes to environmental rights, you know, so we need a socialist government to protect the environment because the environment's a common good, and so you need a guardian government to take care of the environment. And that makes it seems to make perfect sense. Until you sort of experience the world a bit and you realize that's not the case. The government is a terrible steward of capital. It's a terrible steward of the environment. It's a terrible steward of everything. And if you have people who own property, they maintain it and they invest in it because they can get future profit from it. So, you know, the other thing that's really important is the English common law uh, and the law of contract uh, and your ability to go to court and uh, and get um, get justice when people don't uh, don't honour their obligations. Now, you know, one of the things that happened in in, in the nineteen nineties is we brought in this new uh, constitution, and the Bill of Rights is really expansive, and I'm not a fan of that. You know, it's it's quite weak when it comes to property rights, uh, section twenty five. But then they've also got a whole lot of social economic rights in the in the constitution. One of them is the right to housing or the right to education and um, I'm almost certain there's a right to the environment in there as well and so you can already see with our constitution is that it's it is 
placing the burden on the state to look after the environment, which is not good if you're a classical liberal. Um, and it's also incentivizing um, litigation from anyone who feels that their environment, environment has been harmed, um, which ends up getting corporations into, into court um, being blamed for things that they're not necessarily responsible for, and it increases the cost of doing business in South Africa. You've also got a right to dignity, which is like this all-encompassing right, um, which you, know, you can also fall back on. So yeah, I think we need to, it's, I think that South Africa has suffered a lot of environmental harm recently, and I think it's directly related to the breakdown in law and order. I think it's directly related to the erosion of property rights. Um, and I think that we need to win the battle of ideas on this and say that the solution is not to go to the courts and try to get the courts to be a steward of the environment in South Africa. And the solution is also not to replace the ANC with some other technocratic DA government that's going to, you know, try and run the environment out of an office block in Pretoria. And the solution is to really strengthen property rights, sort out the administration of justice, um, and and the environment will take care of itself. Absolutely, yeah. fellas. Um, I'm just checking. We're a bit short on time. <clears throat> when the last effectively 15 minutes of the show, this is Liberty and Friends, your news roundup show here on the BDL show. My name is Sichle Mobese. I'm in conversation with Chris Hatting from the IRR, Richard Wilkinson, an attorney and a tax specialist, as you now heard, or rather tax attorney, rather out in the Cape. Uh, if you see him don some garlic and uh, a crucifix and uh, a wooden stake, just know that Sars is probably at his door. Gideon uh, Newbert, who of course is the host of the Paratus.info show. Shout out to Gideon and the excellent work he's doing uh, out in that part of the world. And Luke Dumont Denga, host of the Man Patria show. Guys, we're in that last 15 minutes. I want us, we still have three topics and I really want us to, to sort of move on quite quickly here. Richard, don't lean back too much because I'm going to come to you first. You know, I put up a tweet and a post on Facebook this week uh, basically saying, you know, dear parents, uh, be warned, they are coming for your children. There is a concerted effort by some of society's more deranged individuals who hold even at times perverted ideas. Um, and these, these same individuals, pardon me, are placing themselves in very close proximity to our children by, you know, firstly, you know, being activists in and around areas where children um, and school children are, you know, they're getting involved in the political world, uh, so far as being want to have, being wanting to have, pardon me, access in that part of the world. We can go down the line in this regard. Um, and one of the areas where I have a, a particular problem, and maybe the genesis of that tweet was the infusion of critical race theory talking points and pedagogy into the education system in this country. Now, the, what is critical race theory? Let's begin there. And why is it such a problem? And why do you have the likes of Professor Jonathan Janssen in his piece, just simply denying it as right-wing, uh, what was his expression? Um, uh, right-wing fluff. Yeah. So, look, very simply, critical race theory, you know, not everyone is a big philosophy guy, and I'm certainly not one myself. So uh, there, there may be other people who could provide a, a more eloquent explanation than me, but I'm going to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, I think we should all know what Marxism is. Um, it was an ideology inspired by Karl Marx from the 19th century, and, it, and its first um, iteration was in the Russian Revolution in 1918. Marxism splits the world up into the oppressed and the oppressors. So in Russia, the Tsarist regime were the oppressors and the, the peasants were the oppressed. They often talk about the working class being the oppressed. And the whole point of Marxism is to try and mobilize and inspire the workers, to uh, the oppressed classes to rise up against the oppressors. Um, and Marxism got a bit of a bad rap because the Soviet Union was such a disaster. Um, and Joseph Stalin was a disaster in particular. Uh, and so in the 1960s, what happened is that there were a number of professors in France, led by guys like Jacques Derrida and uh, Michel Foucault, who reformed Marxism uh, by turning it into what's called postmodernism. And not to get too complicated, but uh, essentially following on the work of these guys in America, there were a number of American academics who developed this theory called critical race theory. And it, and it takes the original Marxist narrative, but it infuses identity politics into it. And it basically says, if you are black or female, 
or LGBT or disabled, uh, you are more oppressed than if you are none of those things. And they talk about intersectional intersectionalism as well. So if you are black and female, you're doubly oppressed. Okay, I, I would be um, the very worst person in the world because I am white, male, heterosexual, and not disabled. Okay. Um, and what these guys have done, uh, this ideology is, is not indigenous to South Africa. It comes from America, but it's found very fertile, fertile soil in South Africa. And um, it certainly was present in South Africa's um, universities in the 2000s. I was at UCT from 2007 to 2011, uh, came across a lot of this stuff. I remember Pierre de Force teaching us uh, Derrida and Foucault, and I thought, gosh, this stuff's really toxic. And I thought, thank goodness, it's only in the law faculty and the humanities faculty. And then in 2015, Roads Must Fall happened. Uh, and this whole sort of stuff burst out into the national scene. And what we've now seen is it's infused its way into all sorts of places in, in society, including our schools. Um, and I've been researching this for the past nine months, and I've been pretty shocked by what I've discovered. Um, and I'm always amused when you get various journalists, whether it's Chris Roper or commentators or academics, Jonathan Janssen, um, Richard Spoor himself, these guys who say, oh, critical race theory isn't in our schools. It is absolutely in our schools, all right? But more on the elite end of South African education. Um, what happened, uh, what I've figured out has happened is that after George Floyd was killed in June 2020, there was a massive cultural zeitgeist that took hold. And um, starting in New York, a number of schools, uh, there were complaints about racism, and, and those ended up with copycat campaigns in South Africa. A lot of people protesting racism, making allegations of racism. And um, the schools were sort of advised to apologize for these instances of racism, and they then brought in um, social justice consultants to assist them. And these social justice consultants, many of them are trained in America. Uh, and what they do is they come into the school and they transform all sorts of things. So a number of schools have embarked upon decolonizing their curriculum. Uh, the HR hiring policy, the admissions policy, they've all become very racial. The scholarship policy, um, iconography uh, in the schools, the school's badge, the school's song, um, and so on, that, that's all changed. Um, uh, uh, the discipline policy has been worked as well. So what you've now got is a situation where these schools are adopting discipline policies that have a zero tolerance approach for racism, which is fine, but they then define racism through the lens of critical race theory. And so they start including things like uh, microaggressions, which makes it really difficult for a teacher to do anything because the ambit and the scope of racism is now so broad as to be both meaningless, but also all encompassing. And so what I found at a number of schools is that there has been abuse of teachers and abuse of children by the disciplinary process. And what has also happened is that the schools have started adopting critical uh, literature that's based upon the principles of critical race theory. Um, and so I came this evening to discuss two books, if we've got time, but the one is called Me and White Supremacy by Leila Saad. Um, mm -hmm. And the other one is called White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo. Um, and for example, uh, the book Me and White Supremacy is a 28-day workbook, which is like an interactive uh, journal that the students have to fill in. And it's being implemented at St. Sibians, but it's also being implemented at, well, the, the headmistress of Rustenburg Girls, there's a photograph of her in the newspaper, and I notice on her bookshelf all sorts of CRT texts, including me and white supremacy. Um, and so I think that this stuff is really now rife, and I'm waiting for it to jump from the private schools and the Model C schools into the mainstream government um, curriculum, and I think it's a matter of time before that happens. Absolutely. And uh, th there is a conversation to be had here. And guys, maybe even as I say that, can I please ask you to indulge me with an extra 15 minutes so we can actually unpack some of this because I know there are parents who are literally perking up their ears now, yeah. hearing Richard uh, get into this and worry, hey man, what are you guys saying? Are we basically saying a racist approach, uh, a racist ideology effectively is filtering into the schools where some parents pay in excess of 150,000 rand a year for their kids to go to the school. So it's very important that if you're watching this and you're a parent of kids in school, pay attention. Richard, um, uh, before I throw it to the rest of the panelists here, you know, you raised these two books, um, you know, and you mentioned of the fact that there are schools already that are beginning to prescribe it in a sense as, as, as material to be consumed by the kids. St. Stephen's is one school you mentioned. But it really does go beyond this because some of these ideas literally are 
the sort of cross racism that this country has maybe, you know, uh, when we transition from apartheid, argue that we're going to try and avoid, right? We, we sort of committed ourselves as a country to the notion of non-racialism, that supposedly your skin color shouldn't matter. Uh, opportunity shouldn't be delineated by race. And I say this cognizant of the fact that we have BE and affirmative action, but I'm being polite uh, just for the sake of conversation. But these ideas that are yoked to critical race theory outwardly actually say that no, race and identity should be the determinant around who wins and who loses, including your kids in your school. Yeah, absolutely. Am I on mute? No, I'm not. Um, absolutely. No, no. Absolutely, CK. And it's, it's part of the broader move. I mean, I think Tabo Mbeki was the first guy back in 1997 to really start the re-racialization of South Africa. But one of the leading consultants in this area is a woman called Lovlin Inwadai, um, a woman of Nigerian origin who I think has been in South Africa now for quite a long time. She's a South African citizen. Um, she uh, is a social justice uh, consultant in this area, and she published a blog right. shortly after the George Floyd killing. Uh, where she basically said that non-racialism is dead um, and we need to move towards something called anti-racism. Okay, now anti-racism is very different to non-racialism and, and the key thing here has got to do with semantics and the definition of words mm -hmm. and the meaning of words uh, and terminology. Uh, and these guys come with their own terminology that's very difficult for someone who's not experienced in this area to grapple with because if they say they want to make your school an anti-racist school you must think oh well, you know that, that's really good but it's anti-racism seen through the lens of critical race theory and marxism um and so you end up adopting um all sorts of policies based upon um substantive racial equity which basically takes the view that if there's any um imbalance in society the explanation for that is white supremacy okay and so they get themselves into a position where um they don't even have to make allegations of racism against people um they don't even have to prove their allegations they can just say that we are all if you are white you are a beneficiary of white supremacy that wasn't even set up by you but it was set up by previous generations if you are black and you support this then you have what's called internalized oppression um, and so they then start saying that you you need to start dismantling the system of white supremacy, and, and that's what what me and white supremacy is all about. It's a twenty eight page, twenty eight day um, uh, book. And for, and some of the topics are you and seeing color, you and black women, you and black men, you and black children, and they then ask you a number of um, a number of questions which the children have to have to answer. Um, and I'm just going to quickly try and bring up. Um, one or two of those journaling questions. Um, they say, what are the negative or uh, racist stereotypes, beliefs and thoughts that you hold about uh, black people? What racist assumptions do you make about them? How have you been complicit in wielding white supremacy against them in a way that you think about them? Um, in what ways have you, you, you know, um, what actions have you taken where you've seen other white people culturally appropriating? Have you called them out? Uh, or have you used your white silence to harm black people? So. What you've got is, is an entire lexicon, an entire, um, you know, entire dictionary that these guys have produced. And they're getting these kids to fill in these journals. And, and it's, it becomes almost cult-like because they're trying to separate children from their families. They're trying to get their children to snitch on their parents. Um, and they are implanting in children's minds the idea that virtually everything and anything is racist. And I think that's causing severe psychological and social harm. Um, and I think it's, I know that it's caused enormous damage to the schools. Uh, staff morale is through the floor. We've had tons of resignations uh, from lots of schools. Um, we, I mean, at one school in Pretoria, I understand that there were 100 girls who were withdrawn from the school and sent to another school. Um, and then the, the social justice consultant who was practicing at the first school ended up following them to the second school because there was a you know, um, the same allegations of racism surfaced there and the press all amplified it. And I think there's some very important questions we need to ask about what's happening to the curriculum. And I think we also need to look at some of the ethics uh, that have, uh, or lack of ethics that exist in both the consulting industry and in the journalism industry. And, and that's, that's an area of my focus and I'm hoping to produce some work on that this year. Absolutely, and I did say to you, I'll keep an eye on that and have you on uh, for this conversation in a much broader sense. Dumont, let me throw it to you because there's a few themes that Richard raised there that I know you and I 
have been victim to, so to speak. And I use the word victim on purpose because the CRT types would look at you and I and say, ah, here are two black males on a panel like this with all these three white guys. There must be two victims versus these three oppressors because clearly that's the spectrum that they view society through. I mean, they literally view uh, white individuals and what they call broadly whiteness as being inherently the source of all things wrong in society. Richard rightly calling it or what they call it, white supremacy. It's a laughable ideology, but it's finding footing in institutions, uh, Dumont. Yeah, and that's that's the surprising thing. I don't know how these guys actually managed to convince principals and, you know, governing bodies of schools that, hey, I need to, you know, teach your kids about white supremacy and stuff. And then, I mean, these are educated people. They, they should read the ideology and look at it and say, Ibo, this is nonsense. Like, I mean, here's the thing, like one of the things that they like to push is this idea that, you know, the world should have like equal representation in every social interaction. And a lot of them, what they will do is they will, they will say things like, yeah, you know, white people make up the majority of this, the majority of that. And then all you have to do is pull out the NBA and say, look, look at the NBA, majority black people in a sport, uh, well, in, in a country where it's majority whites. Now, are you saying that there's some sort of oppression against whites in the NBA? And then they can't answer that. The, the, the thing is that a lot of people have not been taught how to think critically about mm. things. It's funny that they call it critical race theory. It's, it's uncritical. And also mm -hmm. what it does, what it does, which is crazy, it, it, it makes whatever white people do bad. Like, so for example, something hectic may happen a racial incident. Then they ask the first white guy, what do you think? And he's like, well, I don't know. I mean, I wasn't there. Let's wait for the evidence. Ah, okay. So your silence is violence because you, you want to use your silence as a way to, you know, push the racism or whatever. But that's what they do. They, they, they're just pathologizing everything that white people do. And I think for me, the, the, this, is, the, this is it. Like the, the schools, I mean, if you're a private school, you know, don't be dumb. Like, uh, come on, man. You can see this is a grift. This is a massive grift. I mean, instead of w why are these guys, I mean, here's one question. Why are these guys going and pushing to introduce this, in this stuff into schools? Why don't they put it at universities and at least try to discuss it on those levels and, it, and, and try to disseminate the idea and to see if it's worth something? They don't want to do that because they know that when those ideas are exposed to the light of intellectualism, it, it, they'll see it's like flat earth theory. And that's the thing. But so what they do is they make you feel bad for not trying to adopt it. And I mean, even with me, I mean, I've been called many names. And even last week when he spoke about Joe Rogan, some guy commented on our show and he was saying, I can't believe three black guys are saying this about Joe Rogan. And I'm like, bruh, like, what, what are we supposed to say? Is there some book or some platonic book somewhere in some platonic universe that dictates to us that someone with a skin color like mine should be thinking in a certain way. It's madness. I mean, like if someone just had to just think for five minutes about this, they'll know that it's trash. But for some reason, it's pe people are just getting indoctrinated by it. And it's very sad. It's a very sad thing because really um, young people should be learning how to think you know, learning skills and stuff like that. And now they're going to be coming out of here being social justice warriors. And one last point, this critical race theory thing is nonsense because look at the, the, the road statue at UCT. I mean, when apartheid ended, that thing was there. You know, I went to varsity at Wits and I finished like in 2011. Now 2014 comes, people have a problem with it. What, how is that? You would expect that people have a problem with that statue um, at the end of apartheid, because you know you were, it was, you were still close to the event. Now you got some kids that wanted were, were born after apartheid, hating that statue for whatever reason. It's indoctrination, and that's the reality. Well, Richard, I'm going to come to you because, and I want to throw something as as you respond. I want to throw I want to throw something in addition. You know, postmodernism, critical race theory, all of these sort of broadly speaking, the newly adopted identity based ideas of the left. Um, place a lot of emphasis on symbolism and trinkets of identity as opposed to establishing institutions that value the individualism of people. If anything, they say, no, no, you replace that and you punish or reward people by their group dynamics inherently linked to race or gender. 
Yeah, 100%. And just to echo what, what Dumbo just said there, I mean, something that's really, I found quite interesting is that the more I look into this is that a lot of the people who really suffer from this stuff are black teachers and black children, yeah. right? Because as Dumo and, and Sitle have said, you know, you often take a lot of heat from people whenever you stick up for classical liberal principles or when you're critical of the revolutionary Marxist organizations. Um, and I think a, a guy who took the most um, uh, most damage here was a guy called Professor Bongani Mayosi uh, at the University right. of Cape Town. He committed suicide. I mean, it's horrific. Absolutely horrific. I mean, so you think that as a white teacher, a white lecturer, student at UCT, uh, you'd be having a miserable time. Um, quite right. Uh, but you know, there was a guy, Bongani Mayosi, was the dean of the medical faculty. He supported mm -hmm. the fallers, but he didn't support them to the extent that they wanted. Not, not that he, you know, he was very much in support of them. He took a lot of bullying. They called him a, a coconut or a sellout or something, and he was so badly affected by this that he committed suicide received no support from the university authorities um and th that's certainly what i found i mean i've spoken to to black parents of top schools in johannesburg who've taken their kids out of schools that are preaching this ideology because they're saying i want my kid to know that they're going to be held to the same standards as everyone else and they're just as capable as everyone else so on the one hand you're demonizing whites and you're infantilizing um non-whites and you're also incentivizing grievances this is just a terribly toxic way to run any organization. And it's and if these kids come out of school indoctrinated into this, then, gee, I mean, we, we're setting up the West for total collapse. See, Claire, you mentioned iconography. You're absolutely right. I mean, there's, the schools have engaged in all sorts of stuff. The one school, uh, the school hymn is called Be Thou My Vision. And the second verse of Be Thou My Vision has got something to do with... Um, and I, thy true son, be with... Uh, you know, be thou me dwelling, and I with thee one. So the word son and one rhyme with each other, but son is a microaggression because it refers to the male gender. So they've now replaced it with child. So oh. be thou and I thy true child, be thou and me dwelling and I with the one, which is great because it removes the microaggression, um, but it no longer rhymes. Uh, another problem has got to do with um, a, a set book called uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, which is in America in the 1960s. Um, and that's got, you know, it's... It, it covers the themes of racism and wow. the N word appears in this book 47 times. Okay. So that, you know, the teacher would say to the kid, you know, Susie, please read page 62. Kid starts reading it, pronounces the word. Okay. Um, and as we all know, part of wokeness is to get rid of intent and get rid of context as being relevant factors when judging anyone. So these kids have been put through hell at, at, at least three different schools. You know, so, so if something like that happens at the one school, the teacher was put into a disciplinary, put on final warning, she's left the school. The kid left the school almost immediately because they get ostracized from their friends group. Uh, and this occurs with the endorsement of school leadership, which is absolutely appalling. Um, and there are a number of kids who have taken enormous strain. Um, and uh, part of the problem is that if you don't, if you don't outwardly show support for Black Lives Matter or for whichever radical Marxist group is, you know, flavor of the month, if you don't change your Instagram profile to a black square, or if you don't get down on one knee or something, a bit like Quinton de Kock at the cricket, you take enormous uh, pressure from, from within the school. And the last thing I want to say is that this is not a, a white on black or a black on white fight. This is a woke on non-woke fight. And 90% mm -hmm. of the time, Wokeness is basically just white on white violence. The people who are instigating this in the schools almost always overwhelmingly are white. The consultants are white. The complainants are white. The black kids and the Indian kids are sitting back looking at this like, uh, what's going on here? And that's, you know, everybody sort of dumps and play, gets into their role and the black kids will go along with it, the white kids will go along with it, but nobody believes in it. It's a massive pantomime. And then they bring in these lawyers to investigate the allegations. And what's amazing now is 18 months down the road, we can now start to see the legal reports, which are a little bit more buttoned down and a little bit more serious. And these lawyers are saying, we can't find anything here of mm. substance. Meanwhile, of you know, course, 16 teachers have resigned. And, you know. yeah. I was about to say, because of course the legal standard, because of its foundation in ration, is a much higher standard than of course that of the left and the race grifters who use CRT. Gideon, let me throw it to you guys. Please, let's all relax. We, we, we're going to give this a little bit of time because I know it's like it's it's the comment section is going crazy in particular because parents are worried about this. Gideon, I, I call this the race grift on purpose because it's exactly that. You know, you often have a complaint, at times anonymous, 
um, about some racial microaggression that happened in an elite school. And lo and behold, some of the actual consultants that are brought in happen to be parents in some cases of the some of these kids who make these complaints. It's, it's a fantastic grift if you can get it. It, it's a ma it, that's exactly what it is. And something that has concerned me deeply is it appears that parents are either completely oblivious to what's going on in, in the schools where, they, where their kids are, are, are being subjected to this. I'm just going to call it terrorism. It really is. That's, that's what it is. Um, or they lack the courage to actually intervene and, and, and make their voices heard and take it to the school governing body and take on the management of these schools and say, this is not acceptable. I refuse to subject my child to this. I refuse to let them be victimized by these consultants, by these um, these little projects, you know, whether the 28 day workbook exercises. Um, it's got absolutely nothing to do with academic excellence. It's got absolutely everything to do with politicizing children. Um, and essentially uh, turning them into woke little acolytes. And th that's, as Richard's words were, tox it's toxic. There's no other description for it. So I'm deeply concerned that, that, that I have not seen critical mass of action here from parents, because if this had to happen to my child, I would have been all up in the face of the principal and the governing body, in, like with immediate effect, uh, like uh, I would have cooked off like uh, a ammunition can thrown into a furnace. But I, don't, I haven't heard anything similar. I've not read of anything similar that's disappointing and it's concerning. Well, or, or part of it, of course, is fear. You know, remember, lefties always create the, the, the climate of fear by arguing that, oh, because it's the, the complaints, because the, the pain is coming from the so-called victims that, ooh, ooh, uh, Ulo, what's his name? Oh, Richard Rackley identified. Remember, they create that, that dichotomy of victims and the oppressor. And because they say, no, 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 because we're standing for the victims who are who have been so voiceless for so long, if you complain, if you say something, then you're basically endorsing a system of oppression continuing. You're endorsing the microaggressions. You're endorsing what they call the marginalization of people, peoples of color. Uh, or minorities. Uh, it's funny, they call people of color, even in this country, minorities. That's how you sometimes know that these people literally take the stuff, literally, they lift it directly out of America. They don't even bother to change the descriptor of black people as minorities. I'm, I say this because I've seen documents um, by some of these people who literally say blacks at the school who are minorities in this country, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, but I digress. It's that culture of fear that they create which prevents um, the climate of people speaking out, criticizing this, because ultimately that's also what they're trying to attack. Establish norms such as free speech by creating a climate of fear where only they are the dominant voices. Um, Chris, let me come to you. Sorry, man, it's been a while since I've heard your voice. Um, you know, but I, I raised that last aspect because part of it is, is exactly that. It is a left who have re what's the word, they've, they've, they've reincarnated themselves. Having seen the failure of Marxism through the lens of class analysis, in other words, that there'll be a lower class, a proletariat, who overtake, uh, who revolt against the bourgeoisie, which is what Marx says would happen, right? That the, that the site of struggle is a class one. Having recognized the failure of the 20th century analysis of class, they've morphed into these areas of race, of gender, of identity politics effectively. And we're seeing it play out in the school place. The question I really want to phrase to you is, they, 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 they haven't adopted that old Marxism though, of wanting to attack key institutions and, and um, establish norms such as free speech, uh, you know, uh, the freedom to choose for instance. For instance, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a very long-winded approach here. Let me, let me refine it to this question. You know, I talk a lot, Chris, about us having to be a faith, flag, family, and freedom society. That, that inherently, that's who we are, because this recognizes our individual differences. And, you know, really, I talk about the individual, really, we're a family society. And in those cases, we're diverse as families. These CRT types, these postmodern work lefties, absolutely hate that. They hate that diversity. And if anything, are literally saying, you, dear parents, have, should have no control over your kids. We know what's best for your kids. 
Well, if you have organically formed relationships and connections with uh, your fellow schoolmates, with your parents, with your church, with your community, then you aren't that easily moldable. So when you dis dis uh, when you dissolve those bonds, as CRT attempts to do, then you can place people in predefined boxes according to, for example, how they look on the outside, the amount of melan melanin that they have or do not, and then you assign their worth accordingly. I mean, CRT, I'm glad someone in the comments mentioned postmodernism, talk about getting rid of absolute truth, but for CRT, there are definitely absolute truths, and only those sort of high priests of CRT can decide what the absolute truth is according to their interpretation. Also deeply deterministic and stripping people of agency, I think. Um, and I will add to go to sort of throw a bit of a spanner in the works. I agree with critical race theory about systemic oppression, but interestingly enough, there's nothing about getting rid of the national minimum wage or affirmative action policies or anything like that, that keeps the majority of black South Africans out of employment or work or anything like that, that there's a 46% unemployment rate. If we're really going to do critical race theory, how about we dismantle some of these institutions of the state that oppress people and keep them uh, out of, out of the marketplace. I see what you did there, Chris. Uh, <laughs> um, hey, I told you, playing check as well. Everyone's playing chess. Uh, oh, even a um, Denzel Washington reference. This is check is not. This is check is not chess. Or oh, pardon me, other way around. This is chess, not checkers. Um, guys, I, I know I, I'm keeping you guys a bit longer than I, I said uh, we would uh, because this topic really does lend itself. And Khedion, just for the sake of the uh, viewers, Khedion had to to bail. Um, guys, maybe as we, we wrap up. Uh, and maybe before we do that, uh, let me just keep an eye on my notes. Just give me a second, guys. Um, yeah, we've covered most of the topics. Um, guys, maybe as we, as we wrap up, you know, parents might be listening to this conversation and saying, yo, this is worrying. We, maybe we didn't see it. Uh, or maybe the parents of those who are at these elite schools might be saying, wow, we didn't know this is a big problem. Uh, Richard, can I, can I, can I have you back, please, on the show? And we'll unpack this topic in greater detail um, and also bring in some of these parents. And if I'm to be brutally honest, I didn't want to reveal this part. I'll be taking this campaign um, to the schools themselves that have been doing this and confronting some of these individuals directly, uh, especially the grifting, the race grifting consultants, uh, so that they can actually answer uh, in real terms uh, for this nonsense. So I didn't want to give away too much, but maybe if, as we wrap up this topic, guys, uh, you know, Richard, the concerned parent, what do we tell them now? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I've, as I said, I've worked on it for six months, nine months. Um, I'm busy actually writing something up now, which I want to get published. It's such a big topic because it takes you a while to break into a particular school, um, find the right parent or staff member to speak to, and then they tell you what's going on. It's always the same pattern in all each of these schools. I think <clears throat> I think what you need to do is you need to demand transparency from the school and then get accountability. So read the literature that the school produces. It's not difficult just to go Google the name of your school plus the word transformation. And look, there's a lot of transformation that's really good. And I, you know, I, I would strongly applaud it. I think a lot of these schools were doing it 10, 15 years ago, you know, taking making the school more uh, diverse and open and welcoming to different people and, and so on. And I think there's been some really important work stamping out homophobia in the schools and we, we should applaud all of, all of that. What we're talking about is a specific ideology that is oh. come in in the last couple of years. Not We're we not talking about the transformation stuff they did in the 90s and the 2000s. We're talking about hardcore American critical race theory, Robin DiAngelo, oh. white fragility, Leila Saad, white supremacy and so on. Um, How about Ibrahim Kennedy? Ibram Kendi, man. Ibram, mm. well, that Kendi Kendi because he changed his name. Um, <laughs> you, you, need to, you, you, you need to just figure out, get transparency on this stuff um, and then hold them accountable, especially when it comes to false or fake allegations of racism. So what I mean by that are people being put into disciplinaries over things that are only racist when viewed through the lens of critical race theory. Um, and also... Um, some really disturbing stuff involving fake WhatsApps, you know, don't let the school bully you, don't, if you are a teacher, don't um, get bullied into signing a non-disclosure agreement, don't get bullied into resigning, uh, obviously if you're miserable, just move schools if possible, uh, not easy, but, you know, um, you, I think we need to, 
just get in contact with me as well because I've basically become a repository of this stuff. I've interviewed over 100 parents and teachers at about 15 or 20 schools, um, and I've collected a lot of content. And um, we're going to hopefully get something out by the middle of this year, but <laughs> I've never written a book before, and it's, it's a big job. Absolutely. And I was about to take, take your time, my brother, because I really think this book is absolutely critical in empowering the parents in this country to, to identify the problem. So I'm just hearing gunshots right outside my window uh, to empower parents to make strong decisions around this particular issue. Guys, I, I must cap it there. Um, you know, I, I, there was one more topic and that was the issue of, you know, is the country becoming ever increasingly xenophobic or rather anti-immigrants? But I think we've run out of time. I don't want to keep you guys beyond um, this particular juncture. I will chew on that topic later, maybe in the week. Uh, maybe as we wrap up, as we always do. Um, Chris, how do the folks find you? And uh, what are you looking to work on this week? Thanks very much, Sikhle, uh, as always. And thanks to the fellow panelists. Always learn a lot from everyone that I get to talk to on these these shows and listen to so thanks for that you, know, you can find me on twitter on facebook linkedin um, just search chris Hartung. you can please follow my work at the institute of race relations as well as everyone else at the organization please try and support us in any way that you can even by sharing our articles and press releases that goes a long way of course as well and just uh, engage with the ideas give us your feedback um, we're focusing a lot now on the employment equity amendment bill as i mentioned before that's going to try and give the minister of labor the the power to set sector targets in terms of what sure. um, employment sort of, sort of quote unquote should look like according to his edict so that's a big focus for us at the moment continuing the fight on property rights of course and um, looking at what government is trying with localization or trying and failing as tends to be the case so look out for all of that thanks absolutely Richard uh, as I come to you how do the folks find you on social media yeah, so, so my Twitter handle is Wilkinson Cape. Anyone can send me a direct message. I'm very, very careful about confidentiality, and, and I'll always keep your, your communication confidential. Also very welcome to just send me an email, uh, richardwilkinson321 at gmail.com. Um, and, you know, I speak to people every day from, from all over the country, and um, I would be very keen to hear what you've got to say. Um, I'm going to be putting together requests for comments to send to these various schools in due course, but I'm always very careful to make sure that your content is not traceable to you in particular. Excellent work done there by Ubra Richard Wilkinson. Very good to have him on the show. His debut, of course, here on the BDL show. Definitely won't be the last. And of course, Udumo Denga, Brazo. What can we expect from Man Patria? All right, so we're having a live stream tomorrow. Uh, at about seven o'clock, uh, we're going to talk about a lot of interesting things. One of them being Kurt Zuma kicking and slapping a cat and asking really if um, the punishment was justifiable. Um, we'll be talking about Sona and other issues as well. And also, um, I'm releasing another video this week or something on Tuesday or Wednesday. And I will be talking about um, basically the whole spicy craft grift and also taking the jab and whether if it leads to positive freedoms. Absolutely. That is Upra Dumor Denga from the Man Patriot team. Make sure you check them out tomorrow at 7 p.m. A big thank you to all of my guests as I get rid of them on screen. And I say thank you for watching this episode of Liberty and Friends. Ooh, it was jam-packed. We didn't even get to all topics tonight, but uh, that happens. We'll cover those maybe later in the week on Wednesday on the big Daddy Liberty show. Make sure you catch that at 7.30 on Wednesday. Lots of vlogs coming your way this week. I must apologize for not being as active last week. Work on the farm has been a bit uh, tiresome, let me put it that way, <laughs> but uh, as we build that agribusiness. But uh, with that being said, thank you for supporting this show. If you want to support the show, of course, financially, you can do that by checking out the descriptor of this video. Most people just, uh, you know, pledge 50 to 100 bucks a month and really helps get the show out and about. It's Especially as I'll begin to hit the road once again, producing content, talking to you, South Africans across the country. With that being said, thank you once again for watching. And a reminder, as I say at the end of every show, <laughs> never trust a calmly 